Not long ago, the parents in my office worried their child was using drugs and having sex. They wanted to know about ecstasy and herpes, and they asked my opinion of the HPV vaccine that prevents genital warts and cervical cancer. Those were the good old days. <laughs> now parents that I see can't sleep because their kids are victims of a mass psychosis. They believe male and female are concepts invented by straight white men. They think their bodies and minds are mismatched and that without pharmaceuticals and operations, happiness will elude them. Sometimes these kids are so indoctrinated that they won't listen to facts and parents watch helplessly. One mom begged me to intervene with her adult daughter. Dr. So-and-so, with his phone number, is operating on our daughter today. Please, help me save our daughter. Can you call them? They will listen to you. You know what to say to stop them. I will pay you. I only want what is best for our daughter. They will operate on her today unless you help me stop them. And she gave me her daughter's phone number. Yes, the concerns of parents sure have changed. Forget about pot or getting pregnant. Now parents ask me, Dr. Grossman, how do I bring my child back to reality? One of the many stories in my book, Lost in Transnation, is that of Emma a 15-year-old girl who became my patient after announcing she was Oliver, a boy. Her mother had passed away, and her father understood there were emotional issues underlying Emma's flight from femininity. Chris was a devoted and loving parent, but he refused to deny the reality of her sex. One day, after being bullied badly at school, Emma cut her arm with a razor. From the emergency room, Chris texted me photos. There were dozens of cuts, and some were deep. The ER doctor insisted on admitting Emma to the adolescent psychiatric unit, but Chris hesitated. I know they're going to zero in on the gender issue, he told me. Their forms asked for her preferred name and pronouns and everyone here is calling her Oliver. Chris worried that in the hospital, her male identity would be solidified, and I knew his concern was well-founded. Many adolescent inpatient units are hotbeds of gender ideology indoctrination. I had talked about this with Alex Capo. He's the executive director of the Charlton School, a therapeutic program for teens in upstate New York. He described an explosion of trans-identifying students at his facility starting in 2019, with, get this, 90% of them arriving directly from the hospital. The hospitals produce the gender dysphoria, Alex told me. They promote and encourage the new identities. For 60% of his students, the onset of their transgender identification was in the hospital. But that's not all. Chris had other concerns about leaving Emma at the hospital. If they discovered that he still calls his daughter by her birth name and female pronouns, he could be seen as unsupportive, even abusive. He could be investigated by Child Protective Services, and a judge could remove Emma from his custody. I had, I had spoken to several families subjected to that ordeal. Now, aside from Chris's worries, I was also worried because I had been telling Emma, naturally, that while her distress about her body is real, the source of it is emotional. 
And living as Oliver will not solve those issues. My approach might be seen as so-called conversion therapy, which is illegal in Emma's state. I wondered, will the hospital staff report me to my state medical board? Might I face investigation because I told Emma she'll never be a boy? This is madness. How on earth did we get here? We got here and we remain here because of a highly successful crusade of false and dangerous ideas, because trusted institutions prioritize politics and ideology over children, families, and basic biological truths, and because authorities cave to groupthink, they silence debate, and they mislead the public. There are several domains where all that is going on. I'm going to focus today on medicine, on my profession. Organizations such as the Endocrine Society, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Psychiatric Association, to name just a few, have abandoned evidence-based care, which is the bedrock of the practice of medicine. This has enraged and disheartened me for many years. My eyes were first opened in 2008 while writing my book for parents about sex education called You're Teaching My Child What? In my research, I came across something so bizarre, I could hardly believe my eyes. Again, this was in 2008, 2009. Emma wasn't even born. Planned Parenthood and others instructed students that sex is between the legs, gender is between the ears, and it's normal when these two don't line up in which case it's gender that counts. They were told, in fact, that male and female are human inventions, arbitrary designations unrelated to biology, and that the idea of humanity being divided into two sexes is false and oppressive. That was 15 years ago. Kids were told that sex is on a spectrum, with male and female at either end, and countless possibilities in between. Your identity may shift over time, these so-called educators declared, meaning boys do not necessarily become men or girls women. These outrageous statements were presented with astonishing certainty. Now, of course, there are feminine boys and there are masculine girls, but that's personality. That's not sex. Sex is binary. It's established the moment of conception when the egg and sperm unite, and the new life is either male or female forever. I mean, to get applause for saying something like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the brain always matches the body. We are not Legos or Mr. Potato Heads that can be assembled incorrectly. As a child psychiatrist, I was alarmed. We want children, adolescents, and young adults to have a coherent and strong sense of self, certainly about being a boy or girl. Struggling with such a core issue is a handicap. These are fundamental premises of child development and psychology to say nothing of common sense. Why, I wondered, are false and destabilizing ideas taught as facts. In my book, 
I warned parents about this wacky world I called Genderland. I warned Genderland is a dumbfounding departure from reality and a recipe for physical and emotional disaster for our kids. It gives me no pleasure to say I was right. The falsehoods I had discovered in sex education were then endorsed by my colleagues. And this is how it happened. The DSM is a handbook published by the American Psychiatric Association describing psychiatric conditions. Since 1980, the DSM included the diagnosis gender identity disorder. In minors, it was an extraordinarily rare condition, one in tens of thousands, mostly boys who between the ages of two and four insist they are girls or express a strong desire to be one. Gender identity disorder or GID is so rare that 20 years ago, only three clinics existed for parents to get help in the entire world. Three clinics. Psychiatry has always acknowledged that this is a psychological disorder and children typically grow out of it. But you see, by the 2000s, the idea that male and female is in the mind, separate from biology, had become a social mu movement, a turbocharged social movement. Activists felt it was time to normalize how we view individuals who wish to live as the opposite sex. Calling it a disorder, they argued, stigmatized a marginalized and oppressed group. It was unethical and a violation of human rights. There was no new science, there were no new studies, but some doctors felt that the removal of gender identity disorder from the DSM would improve patients' lives. In 2008, the APA planned the fifth edition of the DSM. A task force had to decide, what are we gonna do? Are we keeping that diagnosis? Are we gonna remove it? The problem with removing it was that there would be no billing code for insurance to cover the treatments. So the task force came up with this solution. Instead of gender identity disorder, the condition would be called gender dysphoria. Dysphoria means discomfort, unhappiness. But the underlying experience of incongruence between mind and body would no longer be considered a disorder. So the APA was saying, feeling that you're the opposite sex, even to the degree of wanting healthy organs removed, is normal. It's the distress that goes along with this that needs our psychiatric attention. Now this was extremely important. It was not just changing nomenclature. The APA was declaring that yes, we are like Legos and Mr. Potato Heads. Some of us have a mismatch between mind and body, and that is simply a variant of normal. In other words, disembodiment, they were saying, is normal. That is a false and dangerous idea. The new diagnosis eliminated stigma and kept a billing code. This was a watershed moment. Again, it was not based on any new scientific discovery or evidence. There was no referendum of psychiatrists and psychologists. Rather, the decision was made by a small group of people under heavy political pressure motivated by compassion. Compassion is commendable, but decisions about medical diagnoses aren't made that way, or at least they shouldn't be. The task force's revision 
of gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria was a capitulation to cultural and political forces. And it set the stage for Emma to be able to say, I'm a boy. I'm a variant of normal, just like people with red hair. Parents who blindly trust medical authorities assume there must have been studies and debate and that this decision reflected a majority of doctors. But that's not true. 